They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It's 919 Wednesday, June 22nd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I got a bone to pick with Bill. You told me like a month ago that the Red Sox season was over. You still feel like that? Joe, it, you should understand that as a Jets fan. You, we're not happy unless we're miserable. Come on. Sure. Um, no, they, they've been on fire. Matter of fact, I spent Father's Day at Fenway Park with my beautiful daughter and uh, had a great time up there. Spent an awful lot of money. <laughs> oh, boy, is this expensive. But anyways, hey, uh, speaking of sports, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the Rangers uh, being knocked out. And I said on the show, I can only name one guy in the NHL. I came up with Sidney Crosby. Apologies to Eric Johnson. Horse owner, been on the show, and tonight uh, being, uh, is it tonight? I guess so. Um, but anyways, his avalanche are up 2-1 to one in the Stanley Cup Finals. And uh, good luck to Eric, and, and what a grave oversight on my part. A friend of the show, too, Bill. Eric mm-hmm. Johnson, yeah, friend of the show. Said, yeah. um, Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And Joe, I didn't realize until just now that today is June 22nd, which is actually my half birthday. So for those of you who want to uh, send some half birthday wishes, I'm 52 and a half years old today, which is 630 months. And Bill, I think it's 2,739 days, uh, weeks, 2,739 weeks. Do you know how many weeks old you are, Bill? I don't have a clue now. It's got to be more than 2,700, right? Uh, yes, slightly, I guess. All right. Like like a fine wine? You're just aging with, uh, with grace? Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> It's just like we've been doing the show for 2,700 weeks. Yeah, I know, right? At, le- at least this intro for 27 right. weeks. <laughs> oh, man. I, I used to celebrate my half birthday when I was a little kid. Like, because that, right. you know, it felt like forever to get to the next birthday. Now they go by right. too quick. So I have no interest yes. in celebrating a half birthday. Yes. Joe, I am this many. <laughs> oh, boy. Good boy, Joe. Yeah, we got to wait. We got to wait another <laughs> yeah, years off. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September Yearling Sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. All right, so it was a little bit of a slow week racing-wise here in America, but we did have the Royal Ascot meeting last week, and it was a, you know, there's a lot of great action, a lot of great performances that I want to get to in a little bit, but you know, the the big story in terms of of stuff that we care about and stuff that we follow on a day-to-day basis in America was Irad Ortiz Jr. getting a little hot water um, with the BHA stewards for coming over on several horses uh, in the sorry, what, 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 it's Queen Mary. I get a lot of those two-year-old races confused. The Queen Mary, he was on Love Reigns for Stone Street and Wesley Ward. And I uh, came over a little bit after the start and impeded a couple other horses. And he got suspended for five days right away. Now, similar to America, it's going to be a toothless suspension because he's suspended from June 29th through July 3rd, which obviously he's not going to be in Europe. He's not going to be in Great Britain riding there. So it's really not going to matter for him. But it was, I don't know, it was, it was a little bit of a story because this is something that Irad has gotten in trouble for here in America. And I just got to say, personally, I haven't seen a head-on. If anyone's got a head-on video of this race, please send it to me because all I saw was the pan. And it didn't look like that much to me, honestly. And especially in a big field like that, with like 20-plus horses, the stuff that he's he's done in America, I think, is is more dangerous. We remember the incident at Aqueduct last December when it was basically just him and one other horse, and he comes all the way over and cuts the horse off at the rail. This is a two year old race, a total scramble. To me, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But what do you guys think? Oh well, Joe. Um, first of all, I'm not sure it is going to be a toothless suspension because on uh, is it July third? But whatever, in the midst of this, he's supposed to ride Life Is Good in the Johnny Nehru. Now. I'm sure, you know, they find these agents and lawyers, they find all sorts of loopholes, you know, where he'll wind up serving the suspension, you know, over Christmas when there's no racing anyways. But, you know, stay tuned on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 tough to really tell them there. Uh, the one thing, though, the stewards obviously over there, I, I like the way they act so quickly, whether you agree with the suspension or not. The suspension was out before the day uh, at the end of the day of, of racing. You're right. I haven't seen a head-on either. Without the head-on, it's a little bit hard to tell. But you know, it, it, it's a—it's not a question of when, but or if, but when Irad gets in trouble with this sort of thing. So you know, if you say what was going to happen over there when Irad went over, well, he's going to win a lot of races, and he's probably going to get in trouble with the stewards. He didn't win a lot of races. 
and he did get in trouble with the stewards. Um, the horse was taken down to fourth, and maybe we'll just wait to get to this, but I think uh, after we go through the, the roundtable here, but when you uh, take into account what happened in the um, race with the Riddler, uh, the uh, and that was the Queen Mary stakes. Uh, is that right? The Queen Mary stakes on the Rid no, I read was the uh, Riddler. This was um, in, in another race. Um, but anyways, I want to get into that a little bit later to show kind of like the what I think was the inconsistency of the stewards. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Bill, you're correct that a I was happy to see that not only did the stewards act quickly, but also transparently. I mean, there was an announcement, uh, you know, literally within 12 hours after the after the races were over, which is which is very swift justice as far as I'm concerned. Um, that being said, you have to question whether or not this was like a residual effect um, on on IRAD about other infractions or, or questionable rides that he's given or aggressive rides that he's given over uh, in the past. And and it was just kind of one too many. And they said, you know what, enough's enough. We're going to go ahead and, and, and knock him on this one. Um, you know, again, without seeing the head on, it's a little difficult to see what's going on. Um, and I don't know if their process is the same as ours here, guys, you could help me out on this, which is, you know, where, where the jockeys would also have an opportunity to claim foul in the race, or if it's just the stewards, um, and, and racing overlords over in, in Europe that, that make the final decision. But I don't remember even hearing about any kind of jockey or trainer, um, inquiry on it or, or, or objection on the race. So to me, it, it the race itself, you know, individually was much to do about nothing. Um, but if it's the, hey, all these other issues that kind of, you know, added up to death by a thousand paper cuts, and now he's getting his comeuppance, I think that's really what it is. And Bill, you mentioned this before about the Riddler and, uh, and, and how he won. And if you watch that race, he basically went six or seven pads over and which, you know, if you're in front by a lot, it's not a big deal, but he like played bumper car with like three horses behind him and uh and didn't get taken down and i don't know about the politics of the owner compared to the stewards and all those i, I didn't get into any of that because there's too many people that i don't know um i don't know that the, the cast of characters like we do here um but you have to wonder why you know irad's horse got dq'd and the riddler didn't it's just very very inconsistent and i would love to have some kind of explanation from them being that they were so transparent about you know what they saw, saw or thought they saw with regard to irad's ride yeah, well, like you guys are saying, it's 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 refreshing to see somebody act so quickly. Because in America, we have to wait damn near a year to to get so, some results from from inquiries or from you know drug controversies. I didn't know that there was reciprocity between countries. So that's my my ignorance. I didn't realize that the yeah, US there definitely is. Yeah. Okay, I I really I thought that was just an America thing between different American jurisdictions. So that makes sense. So then that in that case, that's going to be a little bit more of, of an impactful suspension for him if he is. Like you said, going to ride supposed to ride life is good, but yeah, they'll probably delay it and, and appeal it. And you know, I don't know, I don't know what the BHA's appeal process is. Um, but yeah, Bill, you were going to talk about the the the, uh, the Riddler ride as well. Well, yeah, you know, and we want Stewart to be consistent, and they took Irad down uh, in the uh, Queen Mary. Now, this was the Norfolk Stakes, uh, won by a big long shot called the Riddler jockey Paul Hannigan aboard, and and they did. Sus now, first of all, you're right. Uh, John, I mean, he came over and just sawed off two horses. I mean, it was as blatant uh, an interference as, as you could ever see. And they did give the rider, Paul Hannigan, a suspension of 10 days. But what was different is they didn't take the horse down from the race. And, you know, I haven't seen a good explanation of, of why not. Uh, I, you know, and people were stunned. What are you talking about? He, you know, he, he cut off these two horses so uh, blatantly. But I just wonder, and is it, this, again, this category one versus category two thing? That is, you know, a, 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 the, Pat Cummings, who I have all the respect for in the world, but he's the guy that's been beating the drum for this. And, you know, in our system, uh, the in the English system or the system in the rest of the world, unlike ours, if the stewards don't think the incident changed the placing or that the horse was bothered, wouldn't have finished ahead of the horse that bothered it, that there's not a DQ. First of all, I think it did affect the, the outcome. I think the horse that finished uh, uh, second probably would have won, if not if not that. But again, if this is a uh, what's going to happen if we ever get this cl the great class one or, or or category one, I am not in favor of this at all. I, I mean, if, you know, there's a lot of reasons to talk about this, but what if if you if you you know, look the ten day suspension does hurt, but this is a big race with a huge purse. If you don't take the horse down, doesn't that give the jockeys a lot less incentive to behave out on the racetrack? Well, I can saw these three guys uh, off and I can, I'm not going to get taken down in a group one or group two or whatever it is. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it, I mean, that was my argument against it at the at the time when we were discussing it was that you know what's to stop a, a jockey from just picking off horses that are retreating anyway because you know that they're, they're, they're not going to take you down unless the stewards think that that horse would have placed above you or, or won the race. And there was actually some, some talk about you know wh- what the what the appropriate punishment is for jockeys who endanger other riders, and it's. There, there was some discussion of taking the purse money away. And that's something that we saw a little bit with the Jockey Club of Saudi Arabia, where they were taking a lot of the purse money away for interference or for, uh, you know, whip violations. And, you know, I think that's much more of a deterrent than a five day suspension that you can just kick down the road or, you know, a thousand dollar fine or whatever it is in, in America. Typically, it's it's you know, it's 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 very minuscule, especially when you're talking about multimillionaire jockeys like Irad Ortiz. But, you know, I I, I think the. The, the system worked in terms of, you know, making a quick determination, but in terms of, you know, consistency, I didn't see, you know, I, I didn't see something that I read did that, that was, you know, so much worse than the other case that you guys are bringing up. You know, unless, unless you guys have, have more to say about this, I just wanted to mention a couple of American performances at Royal Ascot because, you know, we're getting more and more American participation every year, which I think is a great thing. It gets more eyeballs on the races from this side of the pond. And, you know, it, I think any any kind of international commingling of, of horses is good for the sport as a whole around the world. Um, so we had, uh, you know, Golden Pal was a little bit of a disappointment. Actually, that was something that people were blaming Irad for too. Was that he broke slowly in that race, and they said they said that uh, he was kind of he was watching a horse who was misbehaving behind the gate, not realizing that the horse had been scratched. And then they opened the gates, and that's why Golden Pal was so slow out of the gate, and he had to rush up on the pace, and ended up fading to last. You know, obviously Native Strip was probably not going to get beaten in that race anyway. The first Royal, Royal Ascot winner, I think, in 10 years for Australia since Black Caviar. So that was a big story. But in terms of the American rate horses, other than Golden Pal, we had a, a really nice run in the Coronation Stakes from Spenderella. She was second in that race. In Spiral was absolutely incredible, one by four and three quarter lengths. But uh, it was a really good run from Spenderella to, to hang on and, and dig in for a second there. Pizza Bianca did not run as well. So it seems like in the three-year-old turf Philly division, Spenderella is above her right now. And she's an interesting horse. Grand Motion, second time in three years. He's run second in the Coronation Stakes. He did it with Sharing two years ago after she had won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf. She didn't quite go on when she came back to America. I think Spenderella has a little bit more upside. This was only her fourth career start. I believe all four of them were, were as a three-year-old. So I think she has more upside and, and more forward to go. So I'm looking forward to seeing her get back on these shores. And then Campadel, who dead-heated for third in the Platinum Jubilee Stakes, on Saturday, I thought that was a pretty good run. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I love having a rooting interest in these races because it's, it's just, it's fascinating and it's, it's appointment viewing. It's one of those, those rare meets over in Europe. I think uh, the other one is maybe Longchamp in the fall and then a little bit in the summer at the Curragh. But there's, there's very few races in Europe right now that get my attention. This this meet is great as it is, but with the increased American participation, I think it, it really is must see TV. And NBC and Peacock do a great job of broadcasting as as well. So it was a great weekend, a great week of racing o- overseas. And I don't know if you guys heard as a as a sidebar story, but um, Paco Lopez announced that he's taking out a license in Europe. He's going to ride in England because <laughs> the, the riding style uh, and the rules are more you know uh, fitting to to the way he rides. It just that's a rumor I just heard, but. You know, you guys are you guys are the uh, the great reporters. I'm sure you'll dig that one up. Ba ba ba! Paco catching a stray from John Green. <laughs> <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland sales grads had several big wins over the weekend, including Keeneland September grad Stolen Holiday captured the Grade Three Eatontown Stakes at Monmouth. Had that Monmouth card. It's a little bit of a preview for the Haskell Day card, which is coming up July 23rd. Also, Keeneland November grad missed the cut, who took the Golden Gate Stakes at Royal Ascot. And the latest edition from Chris McGrath's Keeneland Breeder Spotlight Series features Bill Betts, who's the breeder of uh, champion Echo Zulu. The story, titled Latest to Show Best of Betts, talks about how Bill developed a unique business model for his farm centered around partnerships and how he bases his mating plans off of finding the best match for each individual mare. Here's a quote from the story. Bill Betts says, it's like running a sports franchise. These mares are draft choices. Some work out, some don't. I want to strengthen their weaknesses without weakening their strengths. But to do that, you have to see those strengths and weaknesses clearly. You can't be sentimental. And I think over the years, you develop intuition about it. I know John can relate to that. It's an inexact science, breeding horses and picking out mares. 
But when you get it right, there's a big possible payday and, and big potential. No question about it. And, and you know, I, I have had a lot of dealings with Bill Betts over the years. We actually have about seven mayors with him uh, in partnership. And, and he is he doesn't say very much. He's a really smart guy. But when he does talk, you really have to take notice and listen. And, and you know, with his small group of, of broodmares, he's come up with some tremendous, tremendous horses from the ones you mentioned, the opportunity to, um, you know, to other homebreds that are grade one. If you ever walk in his office, he only has grade one pictures up on his wall and it's an entire wall. I mean, it's really amazing. So, um, you know, I, I was really pleased to see that he was spotlighted because Bill doesn't do very many interviews. Um, and, and it was really great interview. And I think it, it showed the way that that he does things. And it's it's more of a science than it is, uh, you know, a guessing game for a guy like Bill. So kudos to him and, and his program. For sure. And Chris does a great job. He's one of the best writers we have at the TDN. It's a really interesting spotlight series. And he does a good job of, of getting stuff out of people. He's a great interviewer. gets great quotes out of people. Like, like John said, that don't usually do interviews as well. So definitely check that out and check that series out. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. A terrific maternal pedigree, grade one winners, and champions across the bay. Echo Zulu Parties! Life is good! Nick's goal a superstar! Go to the back. Good luck. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three year old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four year old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Triple Crown winner Justify had his third winner on Friday. With Clarkland Farm homebred Just Cindy, who won by two and a quarter lengths at Churchill Downs. He also had his first stakes horse on Saturday, went to Homo, we mentioned on the show. First out, ran second in the Facing Tipton Futurity at Santa Anita for Doug O'Neill. And Munnings added his 10th Hag Your TDN Rising Star on Friday with Money's Gold, who went through an opening quarter in 22.41 and went on to win by over 14 lengths. The juvenile was trained by Todd Pletcher. It was a three hundred thousand dollar yearling purchase for Robert and Luana Lowe. That's a that's a two year old that might be worth a segment on her own in the future because that was one of the most impressive two year old races you'll see this early in the year. Got a one hundred one buyer, which is basically unheard of for a June two year old. So definitely a horse worth watching. There was a story uh, in earlier this week in the TDN about her, and it's definitely a horse to to keep an eye on for the summer at Saratoga because that's. That's serious precocity to win by 14 lengths. Stopped the clock in like 56 and two. So basically was, was went home in 34 flat, basically around the turn. Like those mudings can really run, man. And, and she looks like the, wor the world is her oyster if she can stay healthy because that was super, super impressive. All right, so we had a little bit more news on the Richard Baltus front. If you remember, this was a little bit mysterious about a month or so ago that Santa Anita wasn't going to take his entries. There was like a late scratch of one of his horses, and there was a bunch of the rumor mill started spinning about what that meant and, and why he was he was being kind of soft suspended. And now we have more details based on a CHRB complaint, which was dated yesterday. Dan Ross reported on this in yesterday's TDN says between April 15th and May 8th this year, 23 horses trained by Richard Baltus were allegedly administered a substance on race day in violation of the CHRB's rules. Uh, the complaint states, states that surveillance video caught Baltus's employees alleged, allegedly administering the substance on the days they were entered to, to race. In California, tra trainers face tight restrictions about what medications and supplements can be given to a horse within 48 hours of a race. He's been, a, he's been ordered to appear at a hearing at Los Alamitos before the Board of Stewards on July 1st. Now, I don't know. That, I mean, the, 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 the two substances that supposedly were found were hygienamine and payanol, which I don't know what either of those things are. I don't know how much of a performance enhancer they are. It says, according to, the, to USADA, hygienamine is a chemical found in a variety of, of plants. It can act as an anti-asthmatic to open up airways. Um, and then the, the other drug or the, the other substance is a um, plant extract as well. So I don't really care about what these drugs in particular, what these substances in particular do 
to horses. The fact that he was administering them on race day is the important thing because like, like, like we were saying, like the article was saying, very tight restrictions on that. And it's just something that you can't do as a trainer and something that why would you even risk it? If you know that there's increased surveillance and there's there's this increased, you know, very rigid program in California that they've instituted in the last couple of years, why would you even take that chance that you're going to get busted for something like this? That says to me now, I don't have any proof of this, that is, but that says to me that there's other stuff that he's been doing along the way that maybe have not been then caught by the, by the CHRB or the California stewards or anybody, because it's, it does not seem to me like this would be the first time that he would take that chance. So what do you guys think? Well, uh, John, a couple of things. Excuse me, Joe, a couple of things here. I, I think you're right. I mean, I never heard of these drugs either. I kind of, you know, reading between the lines, it doesn't seem like they're real super potent performance enhancers. But again, that's not the point. Um, you can't give it to the horses on the day of a race. And he wasn't just caught want, doing it once. He was caught 23 times. Um, the other thing about this that, that jumped off the uh, page to me is that how was he caught? Surveillance cameras. And, you know, this is something we've mentioned before. Shouldn't there be a surveillance camera in every barn, in every racetrack in the United States of America? And then we're going to get into uh, some good, uh, some you know, another thing we're going to pat Sandy down the back in a minute was about their safety record. This is, again, the Stornick Group slash Sandy slash First Racing doing it right. They're putting these darn cameras in there. And if, if you're doing something, you're going to get caught. It does beg the question, what was he thinking? You know, you're doing this. You know, there's these cameras here. You know, why would you go ahead and do it? I, I think some, you know, maybe these guys just think that they're bulletproof because they've probably been doing these sort of things for years and, and never getting caught. But. Again, you know, I don't know how many surveillance cameras there are at the backstretch of Saratoga, the backstretch of Churchill Downs, the backstretch of Keeneland or whatnot. But my understanding is that at Santa Anita, they're in every single barn. And that's absolutely the way it should be. So good for Santa Anita. Uh, we'll see what happens to Richard Baltus down the road, because not only does he have the CHRB potential suspension, but he was also, and again, Santa Anita has been real careful about what they say, but it appears that they put a ban in on him as well. So if he gets a 45 day suspension or something like this, then the next question is, will Santa Anita let him back? Um, you know, th that's something we don't know yet. And it's great for the industry that at least we have the ability to go ahead and police in this way. And if we have video cameras and surveillance cameras, then it's just one more piece of evidence um, to show against, you know, against trainers um, with regard and veterinarians for that matter, with regard to how they're handling horses on race day. And and I know and you guys know this as well from being on the backstretch, when a horse is entered, um, I mean, it's gotten to the point where like you can't get within 10 feet of the horse. I mean, there, there's a cone there, there's a, a stall uh, sign that says, um, racing, do not disturb, you know, or, or in today, do not, you know, do not touch. I mean, it, and it's in three different languages. I mean, and, it, and basically you can't get near one of your horses on race day. And, and quite frankly, that's the way it should be because these horses um, should be running on their own talents, not on what the chemical advances can be. Do the drugs that, 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 that are allegedly, you know, in question here, do they really enhance? It doesn't matter how much they enhance. If they enhance a little bit and give somebody a little bit of an edge, you've seen how many races have been won or lost, you know, based on, uh, you know, feet run and based on, uh, you know, maybe it, it opens up their bronchioles 1% more. Well, then that's an advantage that, that they have over a different horse. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be happening. And you guys mentioned also the timing of it. You can't, you just can't mess with these horses. 24, 48 hours before they run. It's just against the rules, respective of what they gave the horse. So, um, you know, again, kudos to, to Santa Anita for, for really taking it, uh, you know, seriously, because again, a couple of years ago, guys, we were talking about how, how California racing may be extinct. I mean, it was getting to that point politically. Um, and, and with some of these other, you know, strong groups like PETA that were coming in and, and banging at the gates and correctly so about how, it was an unsafe industry, and and Santa Anita in particular has done a really good job of uh, safety measures, of changing the racetrack, of getting surveillance cameras, of really taking this seriously. Um, and, and and I really, you know, I as a as an owner appreciate the fact that that the Sterna Group is doing this, and they're on the forefront of really making this, you know, a serious charge. So I don't know what's going to happen, you know, in in the court of appeals with with Baltus and his and his attorneys and everything like that. Um, but it's got to make some of these trainers pause. And at least think about what they're doing now. I mean, not change them for what they're doing, because Bill, as you as you mentioned before, when somebody gets away with something, they think they're bulletproof and they can continue to get away with it over and over again. 
Um, but it's nice to know that that a couple of these racetracks are starting to implement some of these safety precautions and security cameras, um, and and that that should be the way it is all around. Uh, you know, United States racing because it's still to this day you can still you know with a wave and a nod and maybe a donut and a coffee get by the security at most of the most of the racetrack uh, you know security groups at, at this point in time. Um, if you look like you know what you're doing and they don't want to come out of their their security shed then you probably just can wave and, and go on your business and do whatever you want to any horse. Um, so, you know, I think it's great that, that we're implementing these things and uh, it doesn't matter why we're implementing it we have, because of political reasons or because of PISA or whatever the reason is. It's that we're doing it and that now it's not a he said, she said kind of situation. We actually have hard facts to show and video surveillance to show um, that these guys are cheating. Yeah, and like you said, you guys are saying the video surveillance is so huge because you don't, and generally, in general, you do not catch guys with testing, especially if they're ahead of the test in terms of what you can test for. So surveillance is huge, and there's no, there's no excuse not to have surveillance cameras at every major racetrack, every racetrack period in America. It's never been cheaper to buy like a ring camera for your door. Like this, it's just it's it's easy with technology these days to have surveillance, and and that's that's the way you catch guys because in general, as a general rule. I don't think guys are going to be injecting stuff or, or, you know, administering stuff to horses day of the race unless it's for something that they think is going to improve their performance. I don't think it's going to be a vitamin supplement. I don't think they're going to take that risk for something that's going to have no effect on how well the horse is going to run. So I think that that's that's so huge. And, and like you guys are saying, Santa Anita is doing a great job, but it shouldn't just be on them. It shouldn't be. They shouldn't have to be the industry leader. And that's what we're kind of hoping for with Heiza to eventually come and, and, and wrap their arms around all of racing and all of the jurisdictions. And we talked to Lisa Lazarus, Lazarus, who's the CEO of Heiza. We talked to her yesterday. That's, that's this week's Green Group, group Guest of the Week. So stay tuned for that. And, you know, it's the obviously there's still a lot of questions to be answered in, in that regard and how much power they're actually going to have and, and how well that's going to work out. But at least it, it's something that that aims to get all of this under one umbrella so that it doesn't have to be on Santa Anita. But kudos to them. Kudos to Santa Anita and kudos to California Racing for being proactive and taking these steps because it's working. And I say, you know, I, sometimes on the show, you know, one of the things I complain about is that. One of the reasons that guys have been able to get away with stuff for so long is that they fill stalls and, and you know, racetrack officials generally would look the other way for guys who fill stalls and fill fields. And it's it's a, a little bit of a crisis in Santa Anita right now in terms of short fields. But sometimes you got to take that. Sometimes you got to eat that to do what's best for the horses. And, you know, Richard Baltus has had 400 plus starters Every year going back to 2016, in, in 2018, he had 534 starters. The year before that, he had 511. This is a guy who fills the entry box at Santa Anita and in California, but it shouldn't matter. You know, it's, you shouldn't get better. You shouldn't get preferential treatment just because you start a lot of horses. You should get the same rules that apply to you for a guy who has five horses and runs maybe 40, 50 starters in a year. It should all apply equally. And, you know, I, 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 Hats off to, to Santa Anita for saying, you know, that's the most important thing is to make sure that the guys are, aren't cheating their horses and aren't treating their horses in a way that, that we would not want to be broadcast to the public because this stuff eventually gets out. You know, this story in particular, probably not a big enough deal. Richard Baltus in particular, not a big enough deal to, to catch the attention of the general public. But if you let those things fester for long enough, eventually it's going to blow up into a huge story and what what you know what goes on in the darkness eventually comes to light so i'm 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 happy to see that happy to see the surveillance system working and i think that this is at least partially related it came out after this past weekend when the Santa Anita meet wrapped up, um, track officials at Santa Anita, I'm, I'm quoting a story from NBC Los Angeles here, which is great to see, period, these things getting reported, the good news getting reported. Um, according to track officials and CHRB records, there were three racing fatalities at the track during the meet from among more than 4,000 800 starters so that's one in every every 1600 which is obviously less than one per a thousand which is the, what we're striving for right now is to try to get that number below one and santa anita, santa anita has done that and there were none there was zero musculoskeletal racing fatalities 
that occurred on the main track at Santa Anita. And you look at the go, go back to a couple of years ago, there were 40 or 50 at that meet in 2019. So this park official called park officials called the safety record a 62.5% improvement over the previous year and a 74% improvement since the spring of 2019 when a total of 42 horses died at the facility, obviously sparking that huge controversy and, you know, basically putting the rate, the, the entire racing industry, but especially in California on life support and on the edge, teetering on the edge of extinction. And it took a lot of work. It, it, you know, we've spoken about this on the show before, but it's worth bringing up over and over again, as long as these safety records continue to improve and continue to be sparkling like they are in Santa Anita right now, how much work it takes not, not just from track officials, but from trainers and from vets and from jockeys and everybody on the grounds at Santa Anita that has to go along with these new protocols and has to kind of adjust their lives and, and their training regimens to, to really adapt and do what's best for the horse first and foremost. And then, you know, it seems like that's that's what's going on in California. And I wish that it were reported on CNN and, you know, Washington Post. And I, I wish this were on front pages all across the country. And, you know, unfortunately, that's it's not going to happen because it only if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing where it's only, you know, bad news tends to get reported a lot more than high profile, you know, a lot more high profile than good news. But this is something that we should be talking about in racing, that people inside of racing should be championing and should be there should be a public re- relations push to get people to know this, to say, look, we were in a really bad place and there were, there, you know, a lot of horses were dying, unfortunately, and, and it was horrible. But here's what we've done to, to rectify the situation. And here's why racing should stick around, because people do care about their horses. You know, we're not an exploitative in just industry overall. Yes, there are some people who don't do right. And we're trying to weed those people out. But for the rest of us, we care about the horses. And, you know, this th- this game is everything and these animals are everything to us. And that's you know, that that's exactly what these numbers say, is that there there is a, there is now a concentrated effort to to put the horses first and and to show everybody that there's no game without the horses and the horses safety. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Lane's End. This week's Lane's End Stallion of the Week is Catalina Cruiser. The son of Union Rags has his first yearlings going through the ring this year. He has six entered in the upcoming Facing Tipped in July sale. You can read more about Catalina Cruiser's first crop in our first crop yearling preview series on YouTube or on TDN TV. The multiple grade stakes winner stands at Lane's End this year for $15,000. Go check him out. Super fast. Sprinter Miler that I think has has a really good female pedigree as well. And I think it's pretty good value at that price. So go check him out and check out the rest of the star-studded Lane's End Stallion roster. We'll be right back after this message from Lane's End. Catalina Cruiser. He won seven of nine starts coast to coast with six triple digit buyers and five dominating graded stakes wins, including a record in the grade two true North stakes, a son of leading fifth crop sire, Union Rags a $370,000 yearling with an imposing physical and one of the best of his generation. There's only one Catalina Cruiser, now standing at Lane's End. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as his average purse per race outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breds. Breed them. Raise them. Race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. Kentucky Breds dominated Belmont Stakes Day two weekends ago, as we expected, winning eight of the nine greatest stakes races. Mo Donegal's win in the Belmont Stakes marked a complete sweep of this year's Triple Crown races for Kentucky Breds. And Kentucky Breds will compete in the richest maiden races in the world during this year's Kentucky Downs race meet, which is spread over the first two weeks of September. Cannot wait for that. Maiden races will go for a record $150,000, including a purse supplement of $70,000 from the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund. The meet will also feature 17 stakes races and eight graded races. That meet gets better every year. And you you can run for you can run maidens for more than you'll get in most purse stakes across the country. So definitely go check that out, especially if you got a Kentucky bread. 
So this week we talked to Lisa Lazarus, who is the eight, the Heisa CEO. She's been doing a pretty good job, and I think Heisa's been doing a pretty good job overall answering people's questions. Obviously, this is this is kind of a scramble here to get everybody ready for the July first implementation date. We still have six months to January 1st after that for the for the drug enforcement program. So we asked her a bunch of questions. We had a little bit of technical difficulties where we couldn't hear some of what she was saying. So we didn't get to ask the follow-ups, all the follow-ups that we quite wanted to, but you'll be able to hear and see everything. And the, the quality is, is perfect in that regard. So it, it was a good conversation. And then I think we're gonna try to have her on maybe a couple of months into Haiza after, after July 1st. Um, to just kind of follow up and, and see where things are at and, and see you know, if we got everybody registered and, and whether or not there are any issues. So check out our interview with Lisa Lazarus. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Dot com. So we we're thrilled and honored this week to bring on the CEO of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, which is the governing bar- body of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. Lisa Lazarus, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, we're, we're super excited to have you. And, and I think you guys have been done a good job answering questions so far as we creep towards that July 1st implementation date. And we'll have a lot more questions for you. But before that, let's just do a little brief background on your, your history and how you came to be involved in racing. Sure. So I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I um, spent uh, really the first 10 years of my career um, actually following being at a, at a law firm um, at the National Football League, uh, representing teams and management on some of the similar, you know, same issues that that I'm actually addressing now in horse racing, such as their anti-doping program, although it was obviously a human program. Um, Following that, I was general counsel of the International Equestrian Federation, where I completely revamped, launched, and um, and ran an equine anti-doping program for 133 national federations from different countries, um, and sport horses, obviously. Following that, I was at a, I started an equine law practice where I represented primarily horsemen in the sport horse, world, a horse sport world. Um, and then I was delighted to get the opportunity to, to lead Haiza as its first CEO, first permanent CEO. And, um, I guess that's, that's where we are now. Well, great. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks for joining us. And, um, we're now, uh, what is it? So nine, 10 days away from the implementation on July 1st. I guess the big push now is to get as many people, get people in the horses registered. Kind of a two part question. How is that going? And come July 1st, uh, is, it, is there a possibility that if people are not registered, their horse is not registered, we may see some horses have to be scratched, or is there going to be a grace period? So the first question I'll answer is, um, you know, from my metrics, um, I feel like it's going quite well now. Uh, we have about 26,000 persons plus horses registered. Um, and the, the sort of trajectory of registrations is on a very steep incline. So we're seeing, you know, more registrations sort of every day, obviously, as we get closer to, to the deadline. We're doing everything possible, um, in order to answer people's questions and try to make sure people will know how to get registered. We're making sure that people have the tools to get registered. Um, what we're going to roll out, and I'm actually going to be announcing it now for the first time on, on your show here is we've heard some concerns from people that, you know, if they register, they're giving up a lot of rights. They don't know what the antidote medication control program is going to look like. So we're going to be rolling out a feature um, that allows people to unregister very easily at any time. Should they ultimately change their minds? They don't have this. I mean, well, you know, my, my view is that once we get going on July 1, everyone's going to realize this program is actually supportive, that it's not going to be punitive, that we're really going to kind of do our best. Um, and then the other thing to answer your question on will horses be scratched? The way the system is set up is that racing offices can take entries of unregistered persons and unregistered horses. Um, but what's going to happen is that the racing office will be notified when they do that, that those persons are not registered. And then the, we sort of built in a warning system, although then be notified and said, you know, you got two, three days before the race itself, you know, please go ahead and register. Um, if we get to July 2nd, and because we will also give July 1 as a registration day as well, um, since that's the effective date, if we get to July 2nd, um, and you, we don't have a responsible person, which is usually the trainer, one designated owner, and the horse registered, then we will be forced um, to, to, to scratch. But what I'm really hoping, as I said, that we don't get to that and that we're able to basically answer everyone's questions and get everyone registered. 
Gotcha. You mentioned the drug enforcement partnership. I think you know a, a big part of the the initial bill being passed and what everyone got excited about was getting USADA on board because they brought instant credibility with their drug enforcement history. Obviously, that fell through, and we're still working through that. We have six months beyond the the effective date of HISA before the drug enforcement program is scheduled to go into effect. So where are we with that? I know you guys are talking to new partners, and how close is that to getting up and running? So that's very close to getting up and running. In May, early May, we appointed the Center for Drug-Free Sport to be the enforcement agency, and they've created an entity called the Horse Racing Integrity and Welfare Unit. And that unit has essentially like five pillars. It has the testing pillar, the uh, lab accreditation pillar, education, science, um, and also prosecutions. Um, Oh, and investigations as well. So we're, we're, we're basically working on equipping all of those pillars to be ready to go on January 1. We have some, you know, top top people um, and experts in their field involved. And we've also have, and this is important, I think, for your listeners, that the anti-doping and medication control rules are actually posted on our website now for public comment. So if anybody wants to have their say or wants to be heard on any particular issue, please make sure to comment before the end of the month. Lisa, on the same question of, of the drug testing USADA, and this is a personal feeling, I was very disappointed when USADA dropped out because I felt that they were the kind of a gold standard when it comes to this. And I think that racing has learned through the indictments of Service Navarre and the rest that drug testing alone is just not good enough, that there's too many ways you can evade the test and people don't get caught. So reassure me, what can Drug Free Sports International do above and beyond standard drug testing? And, you know, are we going to come January 1, are we going to catch the bad guys? I'll put it as simple as that. Yeah, so I actually feel really comfortable that the alternative that we selected is going to be as effective or more as effective or more than what we were initially discussing, and that's because we put a lot of investment into the the investigation component. Um, you know, we have um, one of the sort of top people internationally from the World Anti Doping Agency on our advisory council, and we also are in the process of staffing up with with some really. I think you'll be very impressed by the people that are going to be actually running that. So the testing is one component, but it's only one component. It has to work um, in conjunction with investigations and with lab accreditation and prosecutions. So all of those areas need to be strong. Um, and, you know, I'm I'm really confident that you're going to that, that the industry is going to see that we have that in place come January 1. All right. So the, then the other question is, since we still have a little bit of time before the drug enforcement program is, is set to take form and kick in, what uh, what are the main benefits now from July 1st to January 1st? Like, I'm all for unification in racing just in general. But just what are some of the specific reforms that we're impl- are, yeah. that you're going to implement starting July 1st, 1st that people need to get behind? So, first of all, you're going to see a uniform crop rule. Um, which we haven't had in place before. So every racing jurisdiction will be will be essentially limited to the same, um, you know, re- governed by the exact same rule around the crop, how many strikes, the way the strikes can actually be be um, administered, et cetera. I think that's going to be an important change because it's very hard for people to follow state to state. Um, there are also obviously sort of welfare and concerns that, that we believe are associated with crop use. Um, you're also going to see enhanced... Um, health and safety requirements and oversight for jockeys, um, which I think is a population that has traditionally been underserved. Um, you're going to see enhanced veterinary reporting and enhanced veterinary inspections, which we think are a key to reducing equine fatalities and equine breakdowns. Um, and you're going to see something called the voided claim rule across the country, which also we think um, is going to contribute towards equine welfare and, and also a level playing field. Gotcha. Lisa, where do we stand in Texas right now? And um, obviously, there's uh, some controversy there with the Texas Racing Commission saying that as of July 1, they're not going to be simulcasting the races anymore. Um, is there an 11th hour solution to this problem? And if not, you know, kind of what does that mean for the bigger picture? Sure. So, you know, as you may know, and you might have read, I went down to Texas and I met with the Texas Racing Commission and with the ex- their executive director, Amy Cook, as did my general counsel, John Roach. Um, we tried really hard to find a solution. Uh, ultimately, you know, Texas's view is that given the way that their Texas Racing Commission regulations are are written, are structured, that they don't have the authority to allow another regulator to come in and, and regulate any portion of horse racing. Obviously, we believe that's not consistent with the federal law and essentially what Congress ordered. Um, 
In Texas right now, the only racetrack running is Lone Star, and they only run until July 23rd. So ultimately, it's really sort of 22 days of racing that's at issue, and I had really hoped that we could reach a resolution. Um, however, what I believe is going to happen and what I'm hopeful will happen is that we then have from the end of July to January 1 to try to find a way forward with Texas. Um, and what Texas essentially did was they, they in my view, acknowledged um, the impact of the federal law by essentially um, taking themselves out of federal authority or out of HISA's authority by by ordering their racetracks um, not to export their signal for power mutual wagering, which is which is ultimately um, you know the remedy that the act provides us uh, with in order to in, enforce our regulations against the racetracks. Gotcha. Um, so my question is, because there are states that have opted out and you know, there's still there's still questions about the, co the cost structure of the bill and, and, and how it's going to be implemented. How does that affect the way you guys will end up deciding the cost structure when states do opt out, like when Texas? Because I assume you guys were banking on having some the fees come in from that state or this state. So how does that affect the way the cost structure is going to be distributed? So I think there's a bit of confusion about what the impact of the opt ins are. So. If the state opts in financially, all that means that the Racing Commission gets to decide how the fees are collected. But if the Racing Commission doesn't opt in financially, the responsibility for collecting fees goes to the racetracks in that state under a certain cost model. And then they have to negotiate with all the covered persons to come up with an allocation. So at this stage, um, essentially almost, seven, I think maybe one or two racetracks, we don't have their split yet, but we have the cost um, resolutions or agreements from every racetrack in this country. And so that, that that falls under our authority, I should say, that is a thoroughbred horse race that exports their signal for simulcast. Um, and so it, it, it just changes, it only changes where the fees come from, not whether or not we get the fees. With the caveat that if Texas is not under our authority, the Texas, what we would have otherwise collected from Texas will have to be redistributed to other racetracks or other states. Um, Lisa, yesterday you were uh, meeting uh, via Zoom with uh, horsemen in Kentucky, and there was a lot of talk about why don't you just that there's too many moving parts here. It's not all coming together. Why don't we just delay this? What would be the problem to that? And what was your answer to them about that? So first of all, I met in person, so I was actually there at Churchill Downs um, in there, you know, meeting with the horsemen. Um, the second thing is what I've essentially said is we've delayed implementation and enforcement of those areas we can control. But Congress and the FTC um, does not want this delayed. That's who we that's who we report to. And I don't have the authority to actually delay the bill itself or the act itself. What we are trying to do is phase in a lot of the elements and not make enforcement, um, you know, overwhelmingly harsh or, or difficult for horsemen to to adjust come July one. All right. Last, last question for me. Like you said, I think you guys have like I said, I think you guys have done a good job going on listening tours and talking to people. What are some of like the, the reasonable concerns from horsemen that you've heard and, and how have you guys adjusted or maybe kind of explained things to assuage those concerns? So, you know, the horsemen are, are the, are really the heart of the sport. And so it's really important that we listen to them and we hear their feedback. Um, and we have made adjustments for them. Um, we've made adjustments to the enforcement of the crop um, specifications and the horseshoes to allow time for a horseman to be able to adapt. Um, We've made modifications to some of the restrictions on treatments like pin firing. There was a lot of concern about that. And we, we made it clear that it's only prohibited on the shins. Um, we, we've, and we've also delayed, you know, implementation where we can a lot of people to adjust. So, and we're constantly asking horsemen for feedback. We obviously can't respond to everything, but we are trying to be um, responsive to those legitimate concerns. All right, cool. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I would love, we'd love to have you back on maybe a couple months into the act just to sure. assess how things are going and, and the progress. But we really appreciate you making the time. Thank you for having me. And I, I yes, thank you for having me. And I'll apologize for the hotel Wi Fi. <laughs> the Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. Is this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Lisa Lazarus, will receive a free one hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group.
Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week features dual grade one winner, Country Grammar. Obviously, we saw him last winning the Dubai World Cup in March. This was his first work back at Santa Anita after he spent some time home at the Windstar Training Center following the Dubai World Cup win. You can see it on the screen right now if you're watching the video version of this podcast, which you always should do. The five-year-old worked four furlongs on Saturday in 49-3, and three, definitely one of the top contenders in the handicap division. So we're looking forward to seeing him probably in the, the Pacific Classic, maybe the Whitney. So especially on the West Coast, I think he's going to take some beating. Uh, unless Flightline wants to go a mile and a quarter, then I think everybody's running for a second behind Flightline. But Country Grammar certainly ha- has has the resume to be one of the top contenders in the handicap division the rest of this year, this summer and fall. So check out that workout on XBTV. And like I said, Saratoga, right around the corner. We're less than a month away. So we want to see all those babies working out. Go check out XBTV.com. Just type in the search bar, whatever horse you're looking for. Most likely going to have it as that Oklahoma training track activity starts to really ramp up. So this is very, very exciting to announce that this week, this Saturday, we are going to finally see our girl, our namesake, Writer's Room, make her career debut at Belmont Park in a New York bred turf sprint made special weight from Linda Rice's barn. And we just, you know, it, it, it feels like your your daughter or your son taking their first steps. You know, they've been crawling and crawling and crawling. And now they're starting to become more of a person right before your eyes. And, and you know, we've, we've been super excited about her for a while. And we, we you know, we love John and everybody at DJ Stable for, for naming her her writer's room. And it's just going to be exciting. You know, I, John can tell you whether or not she can run. You know, we, we can't run either. So even if she doesn't, we'll love her all the same. But no matter what, it's going to be cool to see her name in the entries and hear the announcer call her name. So, yeah, we, you guys got to be excited as well. We're very excited. And, you know, the bar is set pretty high because, uh, you know, when Stan or Goodside went out and won first time out, um, all of a sudden, like all these namesakes from the, that, that derived from the writer's room, uh, show, you know, it, it got stepped up a lot. So that's why we kind of gave this filly a little bit more time. I know Linda wanted to breeze her a couple more times to make sure that she was really good and tight for this race. Um, with baby races, I mean, she's a three-year-old, but with maidens, you never know. You just never know what's going to happen. Um, I do know that she's faster than the three of us. So if we were in a four, <laughs> four-person four race, she would still win that race, um, which is good. Uh, but, you know, she's, she's bred the, like both the turf and the dirt. So I think even if it rains and comes off, we're probably still going to run in the slop as well. Um, but it's exciting to see her, uh, you know, getting ready to run. And uh, like you mentioned, to see her name in the in the program and the, and the racing form is going to be really super excited. Um, I'm not going to be out there on Saturday, but certainly if you want to go out and root her on, um, and if you use the code word writer's room, the code word writer's room, then we'll let you in the winner's circle. Uh, just make sure you say it to Linda really loud and proud, writer's room, the show. Yeah, for sure. And then we actually we're, we're probably showing it right now. But uh, but shout out to, to Sue and, and Patty, who were at Belmont yesterday, shooting a lot of footage of her and, and some photos of her. She's on page two in the TDN uh, in, in today's edition. So, yeah, it's it's really exciting. And it's really a cool couple of weeks. Cause first, we're, we're, we're parodied and caricatured in the Remy cartoon. And now we got a horse. We got, yeah, it was right behind John. I, yeah, I got to get I got to get my frame. Shout out to Remy for sending the print. I, I got that last week. So can't wait to put that up on my wall. But yeah, well, you know, I, my head can't get much bigger, but, you know, it's, it's <laughs> definitely a concern with the things that have been going on the last few weeks for this show. But it's it's always exciting. And, and yeah, can't wait, cannot wait to see her run and we'll be rooting her on for sure. 
And 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 just as an update, because I know Skip, uh, you know, super super uh, fan Skip was asking me. Um, Stay on a good side was shipped to Churchill Downs, um, breezed on that racetrack, and is still on course to run in the Bashful Manor July Fourth weekend. Um, yep. So we're we're super excited about that. And depending on how he and Writers Room run, you know, in the next couple of weeks, there could be another naming contest in the mix. Lane's End, you hear that? The the last one you got a lot got a lot out of that naming contest week after week after week. Somebody else wants to outbid Lane's End and do a, do a naming contest. No, that was so much fun. And uh, yeah, it's you know, stay on our good side, looking like a little bit of a monster. Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not send in some names and, and and see if we can get another one? And John, three or four years from now, you'll have to breed writers' room to stay on our good side, right? You know, if, if only that would happen, Bill. And and maybe maybe he'll stand at Lane's End with his father and and grandfather. I mean, that would really be good. Um, but and, and just if we do another naming contest, can we just make sure that everyone understands that you can't just beat up on Bill? You can't just name horses like Bill's a curmudgeon or Bill's ass <laughs> or you know like. Or the Red Sox suck because that those names have already been taken, actually. So we need to come up with some really good names about like like what Skip did with his 30 entries. I would say 29 of Skip's 30 entries were really solid and right on the mark, um, you know, with regard to the breeding. So if we do it again, if we get a sponsor for, you know, for this and we do it again, then um, it, it'll it'll be uh, extra juice for the show. And it's just so much fun to, to have a horse named after the show. Um, and like you said, Joe, it, it does inflate our egos that much more, um, but we deserve it. Totally. <laughs> that's a we, that's a little, little lesser known secret that every time John misses an interview, it's because he pulled a muscle pulled a muscle from patting himself on the back a little bit too much, like Barry Horowitz. <laughs> but yeah, Saturday, writers' room, set an alarm. We don't know which race it's going to be yet. Their entries are going to come out later today. But yeah, we'll we'll all be watching and, and rooting our girl on. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. Stone Silent, who's owned by West Point in partnership with Tala Racing and Edwin Barker, went on debut in the Facing Tip and Debutante Stakes at Santa Anita on Saturday. The juvenile filly could be the next star for John Sadler, who's obviously his big star, superstar flight line. Now back in training at Santa Anita, so can't wait to see him run again. And also, as John mentioned, Brigadier General is going to be running on Saturday in the Ohio Derby, the Grade 3 Ohio Derby at Thistledown. So best of luck to, to all the West Point partners with him and with that really exciting two-year-old filly. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the Bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way when it comes to being at the sales ground showing your horses we are with your horse just driving up down the road every day there's not a time that i don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport the animal the people that come to invest in the game i want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business can benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. After another highly productive weekend, Legacy now has 100 winners of 129 races this year. Legacy grads have also earned nearly $4 million in purses already in 2022, which is a big number. They'll kick off their yearling sales season next month at the Facing Tipton July sale. And I know John was looking at a horse of theirs in the catalog. Yeah, I got their catalog a couple of days ago and, and was leaping through it. And I saw that Legacy Bloodstock has one horse in the sale, which usually leads me to believe that he must be a superstar because you don't just bring one horse to a sale um, unless you really feel like that he's going to knock out of the park. It's a practical joke colt um, out of a Malibu moon mare from uh, Devil His Due's family. So Devil His Due, multiple grade one winner, made almost $4 million on the racetrack. And uh, this colt is closely bred to uh, the Devil His Due. 
practical joke has had a pretty good uh, first year, you know, with with wit and uh, girl with a dream and and many other graded and, and black type winners. Uh, so I'm going to be curious. I'm actually going to be there at the sale. I'm going to be curious to see hip 276, 276 at Legacy Bloodstock, a practical joke cult um, that they'll be selling in a one horse consignment. So I'm really anxious to see how this cult looks. Really got some great sponsor across over here. Practical Joke at Coolmore, and then Legacy with the horse at Facing Tipton, and then John Green and DJ Stable and the Green Group milling around the Facing Tipton July sales crowd. So best of luck to, to everybody, to Tommy and Wendy and, and everybody at Legacy with the yearling sales season. I know, I know it's going to start getting busy for you guys real soon. So, so good luck to y'all. This week's Remy cartoon, very, very fitting for this week's show. We had Lisa Lazarus on, the, the CEO of Haiza. And it's everybody, it's the horses, the jocks, the breeders, the horsemen, all strapped in on the rocket ship. And the Haiza general looking in and saying, we're pretty sure we're a go for a launch. That's kind of where we're at right now. We're all, we're, we're, I think it's, it's, we're all going to be flying by the seat of our pants a little bit. I do think we have a lot of smart people that are involved and are trying to, to get everything unified. But it's going to, you know, there's, there's going to be challenges and there's going to be some back and forth in the early days of this. But I think the main thing is that everybody gets registered and, and you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So sh- shout out to Remy because that was that was perfect, perfect cartoon for this week's show. As we look forward, we're now how many days? We're, we're nine days away from the implementation of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. It feels like a million years ago that it was passed and, you know, we'll see how it goes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland September sale begins Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at the world's yearlingsale.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Lisa Lazarus, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week, and go Writers Room! <laughs>